Hey everyone, thanks for joining us for part two of our podcast, uh, talking about the important parameters for detector selection. Uh, my name is Jake Lee, currently the business development manager at Hamamatsu Photonics. And joining me today are two senior engineers. Uh, Dino Biltron is an application engineer specializing in photosensor, and Neil Patel is an application engineer specializing in sensor modules. Welcome back, guys. Hey, Jake. Thanks for having me. Hey, Jake. Good to be here. So guys, in our last discussion, we came with an important list on how to select the different parameters for our detector, gain, sensitivity, dynamic range, active area, noise, and bandwidth. There's a lot to consider for any customer. So today, why don't we focus on gain? Does that sound good to everyone? Yeah, that works. Let's do it. Great. Let's, uh, uh, you know, just to start, I was thinking, we, why don't we explain what gain is? Can you give us a summary of what gain is and why it is important, you know? Yeah, so when we say detected with gain, we're referring to a specific type of gain, which is the intrinsic, or in other words, the internal gain of the photo detector. So, for example, a photo diode is detected with that gain. So, when a photon is detected, it's only converted to one electron. A detector with gain means the photon is converted to an electron, then the electron is multiplied within the detector. So, one photon results in many electrons. Got it. I'm curious, though, how the gain is actually created in this in the detector. One detector I see a uh, customer commonly use in LiDAR is APD or avalanche photodial. Can you give us an idea how gain is created for that particular detector first? Yeah, sure. So um, with APD, the gain is created by impact ionization. And what that means is we're accelerating the carriers, both electrons and holes, by applying a voltage to create an electric field. And so these energetic carriers can then knock other electrons and holes into the conduction band, which creates another electron hole pair. Got it. How about silicon photomultiplier or our MPPCs, uh, which is also a semiconductor detector? Uh, I guess it should be similar to APDs, right? Well, the starting principle is the same as APD in that the gain is created by impact ionization. But the MPPC, you can think of as an array of APDs which are biased above the breakdown voltage, which in, in what we call the Geiger region. So actually what happens is the avalanche doesn't stop in its own like it does in the APD. So how do you stop the avalanche? So we have to add a quenching resistor, which brings down the bias of the microcell to reset it. And that is built into the MPPC directly? Yeah, yeah, it's built into the chip. So the customer just needs to connect the positive voltage to the cathode and read out the signal from the anode. So from the, the perspective of the user, it's pretty simple to use. Got it. How about the traditional tube technology or our photomultiplier tube? How is the gain created for that detector? Yeah, so the PMT is, um, is much more different. So with the PMT, the photoelectron is generated at the cathode, which is just behind the front window of the, the glass tube. And then what we do is we take this electron from the cathode, we, we accelerate it to, the, to the, the dynodes with high electric fields so that when the electron strikes the dynodes, the dynode will then emit several more electrons, which is then accelerated to the next dynode and so on. I see. That that's completely understood. How about so? It's all about accelerating the electrons, then, right? Yeah. So it's part of it is accelerating the electrons, but also the the dynode material affects how many secondary electrons are emitted. So okay, that's great to know. So now we know how the gain are generated. Uh, well, then what kind of gain can we expect? Can someone anyone expect from these detectors? Uh, so typical gain, like for the APD, it's on the order of a hundred or so. Uh, MPPC and PMT is much higher. It's it's from several hundred thousands to a few million. That's a, actually quite impressive. That's a ton of gain coming from one photon, ton of electrons actually coming from one photon. So why would someone need that much gain though? Yeah, so with that much gain, you can actually see an individual pulse from one detected photon in an oscilloscope. So it's a huge benefit to be able to see a signal from a single photon. But couldn't somebody just design external amplifier with the same kind of gain um, you know is, is that possible neil yeah i mean these gain values are possible with an amplifier but the amplifier circuit will amplify everything before it including the noise got it but let's say you have one photon and it generates one electron couldn't the amplifier magnify that signal too well you have to remember that everything between the detector and output generates noise. 
and other noise sources like amplifiers and cabling will be orders of magnitude higher than one electron. So the amplifier is amplifying all of that, and all you will see is noise if the signal from the detector is very low. Even circuits that don't use amplifiers and use just a low resistor would have noise, right, Dino? Yeah, everything will introduce some kind of noise, and even resistors have what's called Johnson noise. So if you, let's say, connect an oscilloscope to a resistor, you're not going to see just like a perfect zero. You'll actually see a noisy signal. So that'll make it impossible to detect weak signals without internal gain, even if you're just connecting your detector to a resistor. I see. That's great information, guys. So, but, but Dino, considering Neil's point that amplifier gain magnifies everything, including noise, won't the same thing happen from a detector gain? Well, detector gain is a bit different because by design, it's selective in what's being amplified. So, for example, there's leakage current, which isn't amplified because it occurs in a part of the detector, which is separate from where the gain multiplication takes place. And, and it also doesn't amplify any noise sources outside the detector, like what we just talked about, the op amp noise and the Johnson noise or the resistor. So, really, if you're being limited by readout noise, then the detector gain is the way to go. That makes sense. Um, but how would you tell if you're limited by the readout noise? Yeah, the, the easiest way is to basically compare the signal with the detector connected and then compare it to the signal with the detector disconnected from your readout circuit. And if it's similar, then you're probably being limited by the readout noise because you're just looking at readout noise essentially in both cases. Right, because detector signal is not visible within readout noise. Exactly. Makes sense. Okay. Uh, from a readout circuit design point, so uh, are there any advantages or disadvantages to detector gain, Neil? There are definitely more advantages than disadvantages. One major advantage for having intrinsic gain would be having more flexibility with the front end amplifier design. Okay. Well, can you elaborate on that a little more? Sure. So in general, the overall output is a mix of the signal produced by the detector and the gain of the amplifier. This is not including the noise of each of the components. With intrinsic gain, the amplifier does not need to have as high gain to produce the same signal or output voltage. I see, but that just allow you to use a smaller gain resistor or low resistor, right? Yes, but there's a bit more to it than that, and I'll try to keep it short. There's a specification for op amps called gain bandwidth product. Gain and bandwidth here are inversely related, so the gain bandwidth spec tells you how much gain you can achieve for a given bandwidth, and vice versa. So one example is for high-speed applications. You might not be able to achieve high enough output voltages since your gain bandwidth product relies much more heavily on the bandwidth side. This could force the design to have large amounts of cascading gain stages, which just compound the noise. If you have intrinsic gain, you can lower the requirements for the front end gain to make it easier to achieve the desired system bandwidth, and this usually lessens overall electronics noise. Another benefit is that op amps with high gain bandwidth product sometimes have higher noise specs. So having intrinsic gain can achieve the same output signal levels with the detector with intrinsic gain and the lower gain bandwidth product op amp compared to a detector with no intrinsic gain and a high gain bandwidth product. Got it. I, I think I understand what you're trying to say. So basically having a centric gain give you more flexibility to choose a lower noise op amp and design a lower noise readout. So I, I think that's the point you're trying to communicate. But how about from the detector point, Dino? What customer can consider when uh, you know to choose the lowest noise possible? Yeah, sure. So the first thing you need to determine is you know if you need gain in the first place. Right. So it doesn't help, of course, to have gain when it's not needed, right? Yeah, exactly. So detector gain isn't perfect, so it'll actually add some additional noise to the output signal. But can you so can you explain what the noise is exactly you're talking about? Yeah, sure. So let's suppose you had a real detector that has a hundred times gain, you know, like an APD. So if you had a theoretical, you know, perfect light source that can emit exactly one photon for every pulse, and let's say you fire it at the APD, at the output of the APD, you, you won't always get a hundred electrons for every pulse. You know, you might get 97, 100, 105, 100, and, and so on. And and this is called excess noise factor or F factor for short. So um, excess noise factor one would mean that your gain is perfect. So in this example, you get a hundred times gain every time. 
but the excess noise factor depends on how the multiplication occurs or how it happens. So we'd actually have to look at each type of detector to understand it better. Got it. <laughs> that sounds like a good topic to dive into more deeper in the ne next podcast. Uh, for now, though, can you give us an uh, idea what the typical excess noise is from the best to worst for the different detectors? Yeah, sure. So the best uh, or cleanest gain would be the HPD, which has an F factor of approximately one. Um, MPPC would be next around 1.05 to 1.1. Uh, PMT is around 1.1 to 1.2, and APD has probably the most fluctuation with excess noise factor between two and six. Thanks for that info. Uh, so what is the easiest way, I guess, to determine how much can you need? Yeah, so the a rough estimate can be made by you know taking the typical off amp input noise current spec, which is you know if you look at a, at a typical off amp, it's about a picoamp per square root hertz. So what you could do is you could multiply that by the square root of the bandwidth that you need to get an estimate of, of what the readout noise would be. Um, so then what you could do is then you can calculate how much current you would get from your output signal without gain. So you could say take a typical photodiode, multiply it by your input light power and, and determine what the typical signal would be. So you could then divide the readout noise current by this, this uh, typical signal current. And the ratio is the amount of gain you'd need to at least get your signal above your, your readout noise. Um, now, you can also do um, SNR calculation to be more precise. Um, and, and actually, if you look on our website, we do have an SNR calculator tool so you can compare different detectors and see how much SNR you can expect at different light levels. That's great. Uh, yeah, the SNR calculator you're talking about is, is, has been very helpful to a lot of customers that I knew personally and, and, and uh, definitely helps them to at least select the detector at the very beginning before they go ahead and do any kind of uh, detector evaluation. So that's great to know. Thank you for that. Now on the circuit design side of things, uh, Neil, is there any customer can do to improve the signal to noise ratio? Definitely. The first is basically use the lowest bandwidth you can accept since noise increases with bandwidth. Of course, if you know your exact frequency of interest, you could use lock and amplifier or bandpass filters to reduce noise by reducing the bandwidth, but those are special cases. And another would be to keep a close eye on your capacitances, especially for high speed circuit designs. So this can come from floated out terminal capacitance, straight capacitance from the circuit board and the op amp input capacitance. I see, so the bandwidth part, I do understand very well, but why the capacitance would affect the noise? So you can think of the capacitance like a frequency dependent input resistor in that its impedance decreases for higher frequencies. So this would increase the noise gain for high frequency noise. Got it, great stuff from everyone. Uh, thank you. And, and I think we covered definitely a lot today. Um, well, I think it's a good time to probably wrap up today's podcast. So thank again, Neil and Dino for joining me today. And uh, also thank for all our audience uh, that's listening. Uh, please stay tuned for the next podcast uh, where I think we should probably dive deeper into the radar noise and detector noise. Uh, do you guys think that's a good topic to cover for the next podcast? Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, that's yeah. a good idea. Great. Thank you all. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Jake. Thanks. Thanks.